Super. So welcome. My name is uh, Fiona Grant and I'd like to welcome uh, the audience here in the room and our live stream audience today for the launch of the Global Roadmap of Action Towards Sustainable Mobility or the GRA another little acronym for us to add to our vocabulary. Over the next 90 minutes, we hope to share with you how this innovative report is going to contribute to sustainable mobility progress in providing proven and relevant solutions for decision makers to take bold actions to address the very complex transportation issues facing humankind. Before we start, um, a gentle reminder, please, to silence your phones if you've not already done so. And for those of you that will require um, interpretation for French, for French, there is um, a headpiece on your seats. We're joined today by a panel of inspiring global leaders who are going to share a conversation with us about their work um, in pursuit of solving not just for sustainable mobility but also for the SDGs. Often we need to turn to new and inclusive ways of solving and designing for complex problems and we will be inclusive here too. Um, there will be an opportunity for audience Q&A and we're going to feature a brief demonstration of the new online tool which is being launched today. Uh, for our live stream audience, please do also contribute to the Q&A, um, chat away and we've got a moderator here who will relay your questions. So let's get going with the video guest. Um, here to welcome us is the Vice President for Infrastructure at the World Bank, Mukta Diop. Everybody knows that transport is essential for everybody and uh, it affecting our life daily. But we realized in uh, 2017 that there were not a coalition to uh, carry that message forward and more importantly to help policymakers to, uh, to make uh, transport a central part of the policy and to have the right policies in that sector. So in, in, 19, in 2017, uh, 55 uh, institutions of the private sector and public sector got together and decided to, to pool their resources and they, to have a collective effort to uh, bring the tools and instruments that would be necessary for policymakers to really reshape the transport agenda in their own countries. So now the pleasure two years later to announce that we have now a report that, and a tool that will allow policymakers to uh, better uh, design policies in the transport sector. So thank you very much and good luck for this launch. And the World Bank stand really behind this initiative and would like to make sure that uh, all together we are helping people to be able to access uh, sustainable transportation, sustainable transportation for all. Thank you. So um, I'd now like to introduce the program manager of Some for All and the co-author of the GRA to give us the big picture before we dive into our panel. So please welcome Nancy Van Dyke. Alors bonjour Nancy, ça va? Thank you. Good morning. So tell me, what is the GRA? Very good question. So this is the first ever global effort to look at policies to achieve universal access, efficiency, safe and green mobility uh -huh. across transport mode. Now, as you may know, transport has been some kind of an invisible sector in many of the global discussions over the past five years. If you think about the SDGs, for instance, there is no transport SDG. Yet we know that transport is critical to the achievements of any of these SDGs. More recently, transport was given a little bit more visibility uh -huh. in the climate change discussion as an important sector uh, to unlock the climate crisis. So from our point of view, this GRA is very timely. Its release is very timely. It's highly relevant to address not only issues in the transport sector, but also address broader development challenges such as poverty, inequality, and of course, climate change. So the GRA is composed of actually many products. So we have the report itself that looks at policies to achieve sustainable mobility. It has six companion papers 
each of them is looking at a particular dimension of sustainable mobility. So for instance, you have one on gender, one on universal rural access. We have also a paper that summarized the consultations uh, we conducted with the private sector. And then lastly, but not the least, we have an online tool towards sustainable mobility that we will hear more uh, later, in, later. This, in this uh, session. So that is quite the body of work. Um, congratulations to the team. Um, who, who is the team for the report? Uh, these products were developed by all 55 partners, um, meaning the World Bank, seven multilateral development banks, 10 UN agencies, we have civil society represented, business associations, we have also the private sector represented uh, in that coalition. Uh, and that work was conducted under the Sustainable Mobility for All umbrella. Now the work lasted about 18 months, mm -hmm. so it was quite a long effort, uh, but we are very proud of it. At the end of the day, we involved more than 180 experts. We engage with more than 50 decision makers and also 25 large corporations such as Microsoft and others. And, and what actually spurred the coalition to want to do this in the first place? So two years ago, this coalition released the Global Mobility Report. And one of the key conclusions of that report was there is not a single country developed or developing that has achieved sustainable mobility. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, this begs the next question. So how do we get there? What sorts of actions and policies should countries or even city mayors uh, adopt in order to get to that target? And this is precisely the question that the GRA addresses. Okay, so um, that makes sense. And, and the, the definition of sustainable mobility exactly is? Yeah, so very important. For us, sustainable mobility means universal access, efficiency, safety and green. And on the green, we encompass not only carbon emissions, but also air and noise pollution. Okay, so four goals. Four goals. So, all right, which then begs the question, how far are we from that sustainable mobility? So in the GRA, we push the analysis of the Global Mobility Report one step further. What we did is to look at uh, a mapping of the world against those four goals of universal access, efficiency, safety, and green mobility. And we clustered all countries of the world, the 186 countries of the world, uh, against those targets mm -hmm. into four groups. The best performing group, group A, to the lowest performing group, group D. And by doing so, we came up with amazing conclusions to actually show how wide the gap is between where countries are and the aspiration. So for instance, on efficiency, we demonstrated that 70% of the countries of the world do fall in the category C and D, the lowest performing group. So there is a huge catching up to do here. Now we push the exercise further uh -huh. and ask ourselves the next question. So what would the world look like if only we were able to achieve sustainable mobility? And here, again, very interesting you know, computations to actually show, for instance, 10 million lives would be saved annually if only we were able to fix the transport system to be safe mm -hmm. and with clean air. 1.9 gigaton of CO2 emissions cut, so that would come down to basically reducing the contribution of greenhouse gas emission from currently 23% to 15%, if only the top emitting countries were reducing their greenhouse gas emission to the median level. So that would be a world in which climate, uh, transport is no longer making the headlines mm. as a sector responsible for cl the climate crisis, but instead a sector that can, for instance, accelerate the transition towards clean energy. So to be a, dr a, a positive driver of change. So um, next steps, my friend? Next steps are very clear. 
implementation. Now, what is uh, very clear in our mind is that transport is a key sector to enable the achievements of the SDGs and address the climate crisis. Unless we are able to actually transform our transport system in a sustainable way, the way I just basically described, described we will be unable to achieve any of the 17 SDGs and the climate change crisis. Kind of important. Thank you very much, Nancy, for laying that out. Congratulations to you and the team for, um, for this considerable body of work. Um, we look forward to the further conversation. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. So um, the six policy papers um, and the private consultation summary, the report itself, can be downloaded now from the website at www.someforall.org slash GRA. Thank you, Nancy. OK, we're now going to look at a quick animation um, about what the GRA can offer us. As countries and cities around the world continue to grow, so is the demand for mobility. Estimates suggest that up to 1.2 billion cars will be on the road by 2050. This translates to higher safety risks, accessibility issues, congestion, greenhouse gas emissions, and noise pollution. At Some For All, we understand that transport is central to every aspect of our lives. Without sustainable transport systems, Edgar cannot attend school, Charlotte cannot go to work, and Amy cannot get her products from the farm to the shelf. The Global Roadmap of Action is a tool with more than 180 policies countries can adopt to assemble an action plan and move mobility towards a sustainable direction. These policies pay special attention to six major mobility topics on universal urban access, universal rural access, gender, efficiency, safety, and green mobility, all which make sustainable transport. The time has come for policymakers to take quick and bold actions in the transport sector. As the current mobility system takes a heavy toll on our planet, we are certain the GRA can offer the best roadmap to resolve the world's mobility challenges and achieve sustainable mobility for all. A little bit of an earworm there. I don't know if we'll all be humming along by the end of the session. I'm not very good at whistling. I don't know if any of my panellists can whistle. So I've been joined um, by our panellists on stage. And, um, and I think the first thing to do would be to find out who you all are. So um, why don't we start at this end, Carlos, if you could introduce yourself. Hello, it is, it is a pleasure to join you today, Fiona, thank you. Uh, my name is Carlos Cadena Gaitan, I come from Colombia. I am an assistant professor at EAFIT University, also uh, academic coordinator at URBAM, the Center for Urban and Environmental Studies at EAFIT University, and I work as a researcher for Peak Urban, uh, a research network led by Oxford University. Super, thanks. Also delighted to be here. My name is Jackie Klopp. I'm a co-director of the Center for Sustainable Urban Development at the Earth Institute, Columbia University in New York City. I do a lot of research on accessibility, minibus systems, particularly in African cities, also looking at air pollution and climate. And I'm a very proud member of the Digital Matatus team that's looking at how to use digital technologies to build high quality data on uh, minibus systems in Africa and Latin America. Bonjour, je suis Amadou. Good morning, Amadou Koudé, Minister of Transportation in Côte d'Ivoire in West Africa. I am very happy to be with you here in this meeting and and same for other questions of issues of uh, safety and security, another meeting that was organized by the World Bank. I hope that we, our exchange will be fruitful, and then we will be able to exchange on experiences, on activities, to contribute to 
to improve uh, our knowledge. Thank you for all participants. We're practicing a little bit of resource sharing here, um, but there are four mics between you, so, so I think you can pass that mic back down to Carlos. Thank you for your extremely collaborative spirit there. Very kind. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Fiona indeed, in fact. <laughs> Morning, everyone. My name is Yvonne Aki Sawyer, and I'm the mayor of Freetown. Um, I've been mayor for a year and five months, um, and have come to this political or public sector space, having never been involved in politics or public sector life prior to the election um, last year. And the reason I ran for office was because of concerns for the environment. Um, we've put in place a program called Transform Freetown, which has four clusters, um, our areas of focus for addressing the challenges of our city. Those clusters, not surprisingly, actually include transport. So it's resilience, number one, human development, number two, Healthy City, number three, and Urban Mobility, number four. So I'm really thrilled to be here and to be talking about the things which are so critical for integrated urban development. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Mauricio Rodas. I am the former mayor of Quito, Ecuador. Actually, I finished my term last May. That's why I, I look so much more relieved right now. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, currently, I am a visiting scholar at the University of, of Pennsylvania, working on cities climate change infrastructure financing. Um, during my time as mayor, uh, I work a lot on sustainable mobility issues, actually thanks to the great support of the World Bank, for which I feel very grateful, and I am delighted to be here. Thank you. S super. Thank you all. Um, so we let's start with around um, the theme of um, of accessibility, and and I'm curious. And um, Mary Vaughan, I'm going to um, direct this one to you first of all. Um, how can holistic, proactive policies create more equitable transport systems? Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I think the starting point in answering that question is, is appreciating the importance of actually having a holistic approach to urban development. Um, so in the Transform Freetown agenda, I mentioned the four clusters, and there are 11 priority sectors related to those, starting from urban planning and housing, environment, coming through to urban mobility, but also touching on things like education, job creation, health, sanitation. To your question and bringing it together, the reason you actually need to have a holistic approach is because transport, we've just heard about they're not being mentioned in the SDGs, transportation is a critical enabler of development. And if you want to ensure that you are actually getting to the, to the goal of um, optimizing your development activities and interventions, um, then you need to be designing that transport to take into consideration all of those other parts. Let me give you an example. Um, as we look at Transform Freetown and we consider our targets, so for those 11 priority sectors, we have 19 targets. We have a target in health, which is to reduce maternal mortality. It's actually one of the highest in the world um, as a country, and Freetown, the capital city, accounts for 30% of those deaths. Our initiatives to address that target include transportation, getting mothers, pregnant mothers, mothers about to deliver to facilities on time. We've recently had school buses put on the roads for the first time. Yeah. Um, this is something the government has, has done and the councils are running. Why does that matter to our, our education outcomes? Because the state in which a child arrives at school has a direct impact on their ability to absorb. So the transportation, having accessible, sustainable, um, well-designed transport is really critical. But the piece that often gets missed is the lack of a consideration of why that transportation matters to all the other sectors. So the design doesn't take into consideration all the other aspects that it needs to. So, so the answer to the question is, yeah, why does it matter? Because it's fundamental, and because it's an enabler, and because it allows progress um, in other sectors. Who would like to chime in on that? I see Carlos reaching for his mic. 
Yes, uh, I, before I, I, I contribute to this, I'd like to say, uh, Nancy and your team, that this is an absolutely excellent and, and relevant report. One of the key findings that I thought was uh, very pertinent to cities like mine, Medellin, in Colombia, is that in that specific question of accessibility, uh, some families around the world uh, end up spending more than a quarter of their average monthly income in transportation. And this is a huge issue, because if you're spending more than a quarter of your average monthly income in transportation, it means that we could start seeing things like the ones we're seeing in Chile today. Uh, secondly, I'd like to contribute in saying that in cities like mine, in Medellin, in Colombia, the holistic approach towards transport planning is also complemented by a holistic approach from the other side of the same coin, which is urban planning. The ways in which we plan our cities and design our cities and design our neighborhoods end up deciding the ways in which we can design and define our transport modes. Absolutely. What do you yeah, I, uh, I agree with Carlos. I think the, the uh, GRA is a great tool for this holistic kind of approach to designing a uh, mobility system. And um, I think it's so important because, for example, in Quito, we had a situation in which more than 70% of our population use um, public transportation, which is very high and very good, right? But most of those 70% of the population are women, and they were feeling unsafe mm -hmm. in public transportation because of harassment, because of, of, of gender violence in the public transportation. Uh, so we you know, had to address an issue of safety and an issue of universal access to public transportation, right? So what we did is we developed a program called Turn Down Harassment in the Public Transportation transportation, which was very simple, very cheap mm -hmm. to develop. Basically, it was an uh, SMS text messaging report system. So whenever someone felt harassed in a bus in the city, um, that person just needed to send an SMS text message uh, reporting that. And five seconds after, there was an alarm activated in the bus uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an, uh, an audio uh -huh. saying that, OK, in this public transportation unit, a harassment report has been delivered. Please stay calm. Uh, a safety guard will help you out in the next station, right? So many cases were prosecuted because of this. Some people are in jail because of this. Uh, but most importantly, we managed to uh, reduce the level of unsafety because this alarm system had a deterrent effect for the potential harasser. So after two years of implementing the program, a uh, woman's feeling of unsafety in the public transportation in Quito dropped by 35%. So, uh, you know, that's the kind of very simple tools using technology, a simple technology, very cheap to develop, that you know could address these kind of issues in a holistic way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, oh, I see two hands, but yes, Monsieur Koenig. Uh, I come from a country that is a developing country. One fourth of the people live in Abidjan. Abidjan has 7 million inhabitants or residents. Thus, in order to address the mobility issue, there is one thing that is very important, is data. Data, and in most developing countries, unfortunately, it is very difficult and quasi-impossible to have confidence in data on, on mobility. Thus, we have to implement tools for decision-making. If there are no decision-making tools, we will, be, we will not have data and we will not solve the issues. For instance, in Abidjan, the capital city, we have invested for the past 10 years, so after the crisis that we have had 10 years ago, we have invested about 200 billion CFA francs, which means $4 billion for infrastructure. But 
the issues for mobility and transportation are still very present in Abidjan. Nous avions peut-être mis en place donc des outils d'aide à, à la décision quant à la mobilité. Je parle vraiment de mobilité, accessibilité. La mobilité, euh, peut-être que non seulement nous aurions dépensé donc cet argent pour les infrastructures, mais en adoptant un certain nombre de dispositions réglementaires, législatives, en mettant en place des outils euh, d'information donc pour les populations quant à la façon dont on doit se déplacer, on aurait peut-être réduit donc le temps passé dans les véhicules par les populations. Cela me paraît important. Euh, donc la donnée. Donc nous avons entrepris, euh, d'ailleurs avec une entreprise américaine avec laquelle nous travaillons, euh, de mettre en place donc un système de collecte de données à temps réel qui va donc nous permettre d'alimenter un outil d'aide à la décision, d'aide à la décision relative au temps passé donc sur la route, réduire les embouteillages. Uh, and uh, traffic, see which infrastructure need to actually be upgraded. Uh, the safety, the road safety, because there is also uh, accidents. But what we also have to do, besides all that, we have to change the behavior, the way in which the populations are behaving on the road, um, in particular and in general with different uh, modes of transportation to be able to adapt the uh, solution. So it's a very important uh, uh, reflection that requires uh, many different uh, disciplines, many different experts to get to a very rigorous decision. So that's what we're in the middle of doing. But what I insist on is we need to have reliable data, and that is something that needs to be included in everything that we do. Thank you. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the role of data, because uh, I know, Jackie, that you were putting your hand up um, also is something that you've worked on uh, also with a, a vision on women's safety uh, well or you I were think about to make a different point yeah no no I th it's great that the minister went before me and so eloquently uh, d described a, a real problem which yeah. is that there's a lot of infrastructure development that happens before proper planning takes place and planning with you know, without data is planning blindly. Right. And I think why this report is so important is that it's starting to get people to think not just about the hardware, like the, the roads that get built or a, a large bus project, but to think about what is the software. Um, and then when you start thinking about software in terms of like how do you manage a, a very complex system of transport where you have a lot of people walking, mm. a lot of people taking what people call informal transit, these little minibuses or tuk-tuks or motorcycles. Um, what is your existing system? And how are you going to make it more equitable, inclusionary, clean? Um, and then how does the infrastructure fit into that? I mean, that should be the second question. And I think this report really, really helps us to sort of move away from that hardware bias. And I think now, as my colleague from Ecuador pointed out, um, there are these digital tools that really allow us to collect a lot of data um, that will help us in this uh, move towards more holistic planning that everyone has mentioned. And I think that this, um, you know, tool of also getting citizens to help and be sensors and information sources about what's happening in the city through their cell phones or through other mechanisms is also really, really important. And that's how you get these feedback loops like the wonderful program you were talking about around um, safety in, in public transit. So I want to congratulate um, Nancy and her team for this really important step forward. Um, and I hope we can continue have, to have these discussions about how we'll move it into an implementation phase where we address some of these issues like missing data. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so in the vein of, of implementation, um, what have been your learnings in terms of what makes the difference in creating lasting collaboration across the governmental and public-private sector space. And maybe, Mauricio, I'll start with you on this one. 
Well, I think that uh, we all agree that um, it is in cities where, for example, the fight against climate change will be defined, right? Mm -hmm. Because more than 70% of CO2 em emissions are generated in cities, right? Um, without an effective and active role from cities, it will be impossible for nations to meet the NDCs and the Paris Agreement, right? But in order for cities to, to play this effective role, they need financing, right? And uh, they particularly do so in many countries of the world in the mobility system uh, arena, right? For example, in the case of Quito, 56% of our emissions were uh, came out from our mobility system. That's why we, we decided to focus on that. That's why we, for example, built our first metro line in the city and in the country, because we wanted to cope the the, the climate change uh, challenge, uh, focusing on where it was most visible, right? Which is uh, mobility. Um, now, what are the remaining challenges? Cities currently don't have enough access to financing, right? Because the whole international financing financial architecture is decided is defined or designed thinking about nations rather than cities right so i think we need to rethink we need to redesign that international financial architecture in order for cities to have much better access to financing and one of the ways to do so is uh, f improving the regulatory frameworks for pli uh, public private partnerships oh. which in many many countries of the world are extremely confusing and very complex and hard to implement that's certainly for example the case of ecuador right, right. so i think that's why it's so important to to share knowledge to do a very uh, important benchmark exercise in order to improve those regulatory frameworks, not only thinking about PPPs, but also, for example, thinking about ways for cities to have direct access to financing from development banks, right? Without going through the need of a national guarantee that many times uh, are not granted because of political rivalries between national and local governments. <laughs> All right. Um, I see Carlos is nodding away here. Your, your question is absolutely fundamental, I think. Um, for for two reasons, I'm a, I'm gonna I'm gonna provide a little piece of polemic uh, um, ideas, but but then I'll I'll I'll, I'll justify it correctly, and it is that that. Uh, some of our recent research for Latin American cities, uh, 16 Latin American cities, I'm sorry, Mauricio, uh, Quito is not included. Um, we can talk about that later on. Uh, has shown that uh, some institutional variables are in fact way more important than what we think in achieving that uh, success in promoting more sustainable transport system for cities at the city level, not at the national level, and I uh, agree with Mauricio's comment on that. Uh, many times some of these institutional variables are more defining in promoting more sustainable transport modes at the city level than the financial accessibility variables, and this is extremely polemic, and I know where I am sitting. But um, our report also provides some interesting insights into that. And it is that in some of the uh, many four policies, for example, in uh, capacity building within the institutional um, menu, uh, they speak a lot about identifying and promoting uh, capacity for sustainable mobility champions. And that suggests to us that uh, sustainable processes in the long term uh, depend on having actual champions that will be there in the long term. Most of them will come for, um, uh, from the academia sectors or from the civil society sectors. So this is particularly important. Uh, in that same chapter, the report identifies that institutional coordination is another issue that we need to work on. And I'm about to finish my remark. Because institutional coordination means that some of the cities in the Global South will depend on a number of municipalities and municipal authorities at the same time. Uh -huh. And it is only via coordination in the long term, effective coordination, that many of the cities will be able to push forward some of the very effective uh, sustainable mobility strategies that they dream of. Got it. Mary Vaughan? Yeah, I just wanted to um, pick up from what 
um, Mauricio uh, just mentioned with respect to the challenges around financing. Um, and just to re-emphasize that this is this is really key. Um, it's very exciting to to see the report, to see that there are there's this menu of policies, um, depending on context, which can be a starting point for, for cities, for countries, in looking at um, responses to their mobility challenges. But at the end of the day, in order to implement whether your focus is on achieving more green, um, and really those four sit together. You know, you don't really take them apart. Um, it, it's a package that you need. You need green, you need access, you need safety, you need efficiency. Um, but to do that, you also need finance. Yes. So I want to just re-emphasize the importance of looking at this financial infrastructure um, framework differently. Cities not only are great emitters, uh, not only are, but they are also where the majority of people, 75% of the world's population, will be living in cities by 2050. Um, Dealing with, responding to the challenges, um, implementing the SDGs will happen to a large extent at city level. Transport is no different. And if we need, if we, if we build, if we or maintain an infrastructure or a framework where, wherein obstacles are put in place, either because of legislative frameworks, which mean that cities require national government concurrence to access funding, or because of decades of you know just inertia and a design with the multilaterals dealing always with the national governments we are putting in barriers which means we're putting in time um, and at the moment with the climate crisis that we're facing that green element is super important it's super important and it's super urgent so we really need to be asking ourselves how quickly can we change the structures how quickly can the multilaterals you know review their policies so that there is more direct engagement at city levels for the sake of speed right and there's also there's a i've got a question for you monsieur Kone, around the way in which the change that we're talking about also requires citizens to adjust and adapt. Um, can you talk a little bit about how some of the changes that you've been implementing um, are requiring some attitudinal adjustments with the citizens? Of course. Uh, very quickly, regarding the question of the uh, private sector, Transportation as we see it nowadays, so green transportation or green mobility is very expensive. We our concern is the, the population concern is the cost of mobility for the population. So there is we need to think about this. How can we together with multilateral can we help the private sector so that it can invest in transportation sector so that the cost of mobility is reasonable for the populations. So that is something is it's very difficult. It makes financing very difficult in the transportation sector by the private sector. The state always have to step in so that uh, mobility is accessible to population. Now, Regarding the behavior of the citizens, I always go back to the situation that we have in my country. The reality, we all know it nowadays, is that the African continent is becoming more and more urban, and this very, very quickly. We have approximately 50 percent, maybe a little bit more than 50 percent of the population lives in the cities. So that means that they need to uh, to be mobile, and that's very important. And what we see, what we're observing, is there are modes of transportation that are less costly, and I always go back on cost. Uh, in many of the African capitals, you have uh, um, moto taxis, you have, uh, and they are very, very, they pollute a lot. There are many of them. There are also a lot of uh, road safety, in particular for women. And uh, they don't uh, observe the rules of the road and so on. And beside this, you have 
transportation vehicles. And in Côte d'Ivoire last uh, year, we had uh, most cars were at least 22 years uh, of age last year. Most cars in my country were 22 years old because there is a, an increased need for mobility and there is a massive import of used cars that is on the African continent, which means that there is more pollution. So there is an issue of, of means. So the population buys this type of, uh, of vehicle. So the state makes decisions that are sometimes very difficult decisions to bring the population to respect and comply those, dis those decisions, to change the behavior. And last year, we have limited uh, the age for importing uh, cars in Côte d'Ivoire. So if a vehicle that is more than five years old, uh, it cannot be imported in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. It's a very difficult decision to make. Uh, it protects environment. Uh, it increases security on the road. But it costs money. It's costly. Thus, you need to communicate so, and I'm going back on the new technology that helps us. Data, again, in order to make the population aware of the risk of air pollution, that's important. You need to be able to uh, communicate with the population. You need to organize with the uh, trade unions. You need to organize with uh, the consumers to explain all this. So it's an issue of responsibility. Everybody has to take its own responsibilities. But it requires a change of behavior that needs to be accepted by all based on data that are reliable, that are communicated to the population regarding um, uh, lung disease from the pollution. So you have to explain that to the population. These are things that it seems to me are important to underline. Beside this, there is a, a large investment that is made in uh, public transportation, uh, buses and metro, and the population has to also own this type of uh, uh, project and uh, accept to take this less polluting public transportation and, and basically give up the sort of artisanal, uh, the other type of transportation. So communication is a very important element. Um, again, we return to the um, topic of data, um, which is just um, a huge enabler for this project. And, and so that seems like a nice time to take a break and hear from um, Javier, and, and I'm sorry, here, Morales. Um, and, and Javier is going to tell us a little bit about the online tool that, um, that is part of the GRA. So, Javier, sure. we're all ears. Thank you, Fiona. Um, <laughs> the video is on, so yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the online tool towards sustainable mobility 1.0. This new tool was just released today, so I'll be giving you a quick tour. Um, feel free to navigate the tool later on by accessing the Sum for All website through your computer or from your phone, but let's begin. So just like the GRA, you'll find three different modules in this online tool. One, data and indicators. This includes 30 indicators of mobility at the country level. Here, you can map the performance of any country in the world towards the four policy goals towards sustainable mobility and also benchmark country performance. Two, policy measures. So you can explore a catalog of more than 180 policy measures towards sustainable mobility. This is one of the products of the hard work of some for all's working groups over, over the last year. Three, tailor action plan. View the policies that are more relevant to your country and customize an action plan. So let's start with the data module. You can visualize data across countries, by country, and by indicator. For viewing data across countries, these color-coded maps are available for each policy goal universal access, efficiency, safety, and green mobility. And they represent how far countries are from reaching the top performer. 
The data is based on the principal indicators agreed by some for all working groups and are presented in an index that ranges from zero to 100. Here we also see an indicator uh, for sustainable mobility that combines all the information from the four policy goals to create a unique composite index. Uh, this will become clear as we continue to browse. So let's go by country. Now that we compared mobility performance worldwide, let's look at more details about the mobility of one country, learn land. <laughs> at a glance, uh, shows that Learnland is ranked number 63 out of 183 countries, according to the Sustainable Mobility Composite Index. <coughs> For each policy goal, we cluster, we cluster cl countries into four groups, from Group A, the top performers, to Group D. We see that Learnland is among the countries in performance Group C for all policy goals, except for green mobility. Next, uh, in the graph by policy goal, it shows how far Learnland is from the best performing countries. Here we see uh, in, the, in the bars uh, that for universal access we break down by urban, rural, and gender, and for green mobility we break down by GHG emissions and air pollution. The indicators that are part of this analysis include, for instance, the percentage of female workers in transport and road fatality rates. On to the next graph, the Sustainable Mobility Composite Index combines information for, on, uh, for the four policy goals. So if a country is the top performer on all four, it receives a score of 100. Since Learnland performs below average on universal access safety and efficiency, we can see that there's still much progress ahead for Learnland to achieve sustainable mobility. For those in interested in the methodology, several nodes can be accessed at any point in this online tool. And for those that want to access the raw data from the indicators, or, those that, or if you want to see benchmarks, you can also find that in the online tool. <laughs> but let's move on to the next module, and that is Explore Policies. Here, you may browse the 182 policy measures towards sustainable mobility that are recommended in the GRA. If you're interested only on a subset of policies, use the filter. For example, I will search for a regulatory policy measure that has an impact on green mobility and that targets passenger transport. In the policy measure list, you can view the ones that you selected and the goals that that policy contributes to. Be sure also to click on a policy measure to learn more about it. And finally, tailor action plan. Here, we combine the data analysis with a catalog of policy measures to create a unique action plan for countries based on the model developed in the GRA. But for the time being, let's go back to LearnLand. And here, uh, we find its prototype action plan that shows 30 recommended policies. This is a prototype because it's a starting point um, that may initiate uh, a conversation on policy dialogue. However, more avid users of the online tool can bring in their expertise and customize their action plan. So we know that LearnLand is attempting to implement some congestion pricing mechanism, so we can add that policy measure to the action plan if we customize the action plan. And um, this is the end of the tour, uh, but if you want to learn more, uh, go ahead and uh, browse the, the, the website and also help us improve this online tool, online tool by sending us your input on someforall.org slash online tool. Thank you very much, and back to you, Fiona. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, 
So we are going to be moving to audience Q&A in the not too distant future. So be thinking about your questions and that includes you online audience. Um, so, okay. Hashtag some for all, um, if you like what you just saw. And um, so Jackie, you, um, what did you think of that? What's, uh, how could that help you in your work? I think it's a really terrific tool because what it does is it takes what we had discussed before of transport is in a silo and shows how it, in fact it's very cross-cutting and that there are some interventions, for example, improving public transit, um, you know, that will have impacts on so many different uh, um, indicators, mm -hmm. right? And so I think if someone takes the tool seriously and starts to explore, this can really expand the way they think about their policy options. And I love the fact that anyone can use this tool. So I can imagine civil society groups saying, oh, we have this problem. <laughs> um, what are some of the arguments I make to my government to get them to move the investment in places we need, um, like walkability or transit? And, and so I, I think it's really terrific. I would like to know if we have good enough data and if we can really you know, push the data end as well, because uh, it seems like it's also an open mm -hmm. data platform, which is absolutely critical, again, for accountability. Um, so I would love for us to continue to discuss how we can then make sure that that data um, continues to be very high quality. So for example, air pollution, we're not measuring emissions very mm -hmm. well. We need to do more on, again, even just the existing transit systems. Um, what kind of base data do we have on that? So, but overall, I, I, I really think it's, it's going to be fantastic to watch how people start to use this tool and shift the discourse. Yeah. yeah. Yvonne? Yeah. Um, hashtag transform Freetown. <laughs> So this aligns really well. I'm actually really excited. I'd said to, to Nancy earlier that I was really looking forward to seeing it and having seen it, I can immediately see, you know, envisage on a practical level how policies that we're putting into place now can be challenged, uh, can be refined, um, can be built on. So in um, within our urban mobility, our two targets, um, one is reducing congestion um, in specific locations, the other is increasing safety. Um, and to to achieve those, we are introducing controlled parking zones. That's something which is no doubt covered there. We are um, working with the World Bank on a project which will be providing um, some off-road solutions. So a lot of the behavior change that Minister mentioned includes the fact that people have taken over streets. Mm -hmm. um, and although people have a, a right to streets or to, to, to walkways, um, there has to be a proper balance between them and vehicular transport. Um, so, so, you know, policies around that. Um, we recognize the green dilemma that Mauricio made mention to. And so we're working on a project now to introduce cable cars, very much in the spirit of Medellin and actually working with the same company. Um, so again, there, we're, there's a lot of policy development that we're doing right at this moment that would benefit from having comparatives, looking at you know having it there in one place and cutting down on some of the research we'd otherwise be doing. So it's, it's actually very exciting and an excellent tool. But I'll say again, that all of this, the tools, data is a question, which this helps to solve. Financing remains an issue, but also regulatory frameworks. Who takes responsibility at national level, at city level, local authorities? In many countries, without addressing those, challenges, um, your individual policy discussions, just you just start going around in circles. But I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that some of those regulatory issues are also addressed here in this tool. And you're a tough woman to convince, aren't you? So this, this, is, this, is, this is good. This is good. She's hopeful. Hopeful, folks. No, let me, let me rephrase that. I'm excited. You're I'm excited. Okay. <laughs> Oh, small slot then. Yeah, uh, I, I also think it's a great tool, so congratulations. Um, I think it, it is really helpful because it also becomes a planning tool 
for example, in the case of cities, an urban planning tool. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, if you if you look at mobility in a holistic way, it becomes a very important tool for urban development in the long term, right? Um, let me go back to what I mentioned before. In Quito, we, we built the metro, and the metro became a very important element for urban planning, mm -hmm. right, in the long term. So this kind of tool, gives you a, a very logic and holistic framework for urban planning and also for policy evaluation, which also is also very, very important. So I am also very excited and I will be even more excited to see the next edition of this tool at the city level. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be really, really great, not only at the country level, but uh, at the city level. Now, now that you have already developed the methodology, right, it could be developed at the city level and that would be really, really great. Um, I agree with Yvonne with the challenges she mentioned, all of them. We just talked about, for example, the need to, to improve regulatory frameworks for attracting more private investment in yeah. cities and the, others, uh, the other challenges that Yvonne mentioned. And I, I will add just one more, and it's the need to develop uh, project preparation capacity in cities. I think that's really important because if we want to improve the access of cities to financing, we need uh, to have cities with institutional capacity to design bankable projects. We need cities to be credit worthy, right? We need to improve financial stability in cities. And that's a big, big challenge, particularly in secondary and small cities. Mm -hmm. So that's another very, very important challenge that, uh, for example, development banks could be very, very helpful to address. Mm -hmm. Great. But for, for many of us, uh, probably all of us doing research uh, comparatively uh, across countries on urban transport, this tool is a, is a dream come true. Huh? We've been working on things like this for a long time, of course, uh, for many of the non-experts uh, in the field, it might not seem like such a huge accomplishment. But let me tell you, it is a huge accomplishment, because what they do here is that they uh, build coalitions on uh, the possibilities that Mauricio described, but they also uh, compose large numbers of key indicators that are widely available for the civil society or the academia all over the world. It is obvious that the next step ought to be at the city level. Uh, I agree with you as well, but, but, but that will uh, take some time, I imagine. However, I'd like to highlight two brief issues. The yep. first one is, um, one of the key findings in this report is that uh, there is not one single country that has managed to uh, comply with what we imagine is sustainable transport. And that is huge. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that within the green transport dimension, and specifically uh, referring to greenhouse gas emissions per capita, uh, developed countries are not doing that well. But bear in mind, developing countries have a relative advantage in that sense, mm -hmm. and that means that we have to use it before it's too late. It's a relative advantage. It won't be there forever. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to point out that some of the policies, just like it was uh, described briefly, uh, manage to have a direct effect on a number of dimensions, and that is magnificent. Yeah. In the tool, we saw it clearly, and for instance, I cannot leave without mentioning, for example, the bicycle. Because the bicycle will have a crucial effect across dimensions. We will see, and the tool will probably prove it much easier than I could, that across the global south, the implementation of effective and efficient uh, bicycle promotion uh, policies will have a positive effect across the four dimensions. And uh, this is therefore a dream come true tool. Uh, Jackie, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, we also have to look at the lender side of this. Uh -huh. um, I know it's coming out of the World Bank. Um, but we, we do have a finance problem. For example, if we want to build bike lanes or um, you know walking networks, it seems like under the current way that funding happens, it's nearly impossible to get those projects unless they get bundled into like larger scale projects. Um, 
Because these are fairly cheap projects, aren't They're they? They're very cheap, but ironically, it becomes hard to fund them for precisely that reason, because most lenders like cheap. big pro projects. So there has been a discussion of how to bundle these kinds of really important other elements. Uh, my colleagues at the French Development Agency are now bundling in data creation as they're giving loans for infrastructure, so that they're building that capacity of cities um, to collect and manage data and then see their whole system. Mm -hmm. And that also then helps the infrastructure project uh, you know, integrate, whether it's a bus system or a rail, integrate into the rest of the system. Which then feeds the accountability right, loop exactly. as well. Right, exactly. So um, I think we also have to look at that element and also that there's also a coordination problem with the lending. Often lenders want to lend different projects that I don't know if my colleagues can speak to this, so they've got a whole suite of things that they're often trying to figure out what makes sense. Um, and so I think this, this could help very much with that too, which is like, hmm, you know, what, what implications might this project have and do I have enough data? And so um, I just wanted to raise that we have the lender side too since we're at the World Bank and we should, we should think about that as well. The interesting tool we needed. I didn't look at at the uh, the tool uh, very closely, and I think that we have a few issues. But we're we're getting to the QA. I will have a uh, question for you later. When I look at the tool, we have objectives for the SDGs that are clear. There is a uh, classification by country, right? So by country, this is an issue for me. I don't know up to where we went down. Cities? Was it cities or? I think that the issues on mobility in Abidjan, in my city, are not the same that in the north of the country, smaller cities where there is no pollution because of the uh, population, or, or we do not need mass transportation there, only small vehicles are necessary, or uh, this is something that should be better organized. How should we classify countries that are at different levels in development with different realities in mobility in spaces that are very diff different, rural, urban. So the question is to know if the tool is detailed enough. Uh, shouldn't we go further in cities, um, depending on the, on the size of the cities and so on and so forth? It is, it is difficult to compare Côte d'Ivoire, for instance, and London or the UK. It's not the same thing. The second question, and it's a question for you, madam, if you don't mind. As organizing the collection of data to do a follow-up on all this, madam mayor, uh, how do you do it in Sierra Leone? Is it the central state? that organizes transportation even in cities. You talked about a few projects. These projects, are they uh, conceived, uh, financed, and carried out by the central state or the central government, or are they designed by Freetown itself, the city, with an investment from the government? In our case, it showed that it is significant that we should have in Abidjan two authorities, one that will organize transportation that, be, that is from the central state or the central government, so not from the uh, district or the municipality of Abidjan, and another one that is regulating transportation for the whole of the national territory, which are structures that really are under the central government. So my question is, what is, Madam Mayor, today, what is your decision-making power in order to feed this tool for Freetown and then for the whole of the country since, as you see, there is a classification for the whole country? This is my concern and my question on this. Thank you. It's a 
very good it's a very good question. Um, the reality is that in Sierra Leone, um, I would say the, the, the relevant legislation, first of all, in terms of the city's role, is the Local Government Act. And within that act, different um, functions are devolved to the council. Okay. Transportation is not. However, so what we have then is a Ministry of Transport, a Sierra Leone Road Transport Corporation, which is, um, uh, M what do you call it, a MDA, um, a department, an agency. Okay. Um, and then, but yet, we have, for example, a World Bank project, which was initially titled Freetown Integrated Urban Transport Project and then became Sierra Leone Integrated Urban Transport Project when I became the mayor, um, but still was all happening in Freetown. So, so I, I think what we've done in designing transport, Transform Freetown, we took a very collaborative approach. We engaged the central government sector by sector for the things that we felt were important, the 11 priority sectors, which I've already said, urban mobility is both a cluster and a sector. We came together with the international multilateral partners, civil society, community-based organizations, and together we arrived at what we felt needed to be the targets. What we're doing, those projects that I mentioned, the, the, the central government is leading on the World Bank project. But we as a city, whether there's a mandate that says transportation is devolved to us or not, we have an overriding mandate to be responsible for improving the lives of our residents. So we're acting on that mandate. And we're engaging the private sector on a PPP, keeping the central government involved, informed and involved. But I think this comes back to the point that we were making before Mauricio and I. At the, cent at the local government level, we see the challenges and the problems. I know that I have 68 informal settlements, many of which are on our hillsides, um, you know, created because of rapid urbanization, and that those communities are very, very disenfranchised and have very poor accessibility um, to, to services, to healthcare, to education, because they have no transport links, because the pl urban planning wasn't happening. And then urban planning was a function of the government. It was devolved to the city just in March this year. Um, but it's been devolved on paper. It still has not moved, but we're working on it. <laughs> um, but the reality is, in the absence of urban planning, in the absence of proper transport planning, which cannot happen by a central government, I'm in the capital city, so yes, the central government happens to be in the same place as me. But if you're talking about Kono District or Pujahu, districts which are miles away, the people sitting at the center cannot be doing urban plans or indeed transport plans. Um, I, you know, I, I, I hear you say you've got two bodies and they're both at the national level. I can't speak for Cote d'Ivoire, but I can speak for Sierra Leone. And, I, and my view is that we really must challenge these structures because service delivery is compromised the further it is away. The further the problem is from the solution, the less likely you are to effectively address the problem. So from our perspective, we don't have a stated mandate, but we feel we have a moral mandate um, and we're moving forward on the basis of the moral mandate. Super. Thank you, Mayor Yvonne, for making those points quite so clearly. Um, this would appear to be um, where we've got some energy in the room and um, a good time to move to audience questions. Alejandra is going to borrow a mic, so we're going to move to a yet more collaborative state of affairs here. And um, do we have a question? So just a reminder for our online audience, um, please relay your questions in the chat. Um, do we have a question in the room? Good morning, everyone. My name is Antoine Sotonet from the Michelin Group. Um, let me first share a conviction. Uh, we think at Michelin that we have a key role the private sector to play in helping to accelerate transition and change to our sustainable mobility. And uh, as you may know, we have been involved into the preparation of this uh, 
uh, uh, online tool, and uh, indeed we are thinking that it's a fantastic tool uh, for countries and, and cities, and we will dedicate a specific working session at Moving On Summit that Mr. Rodas knows quite well, uh, 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 next June 2020, from 3 to, to 5th of June. I had a specific question, for, especially for the mayors. Um, you know that we, uh, many cities are facing sustainable mobility issues, cities from the south, but also cities from the north. And uh, this online tool is addressing many, many issues. What is, from your view, the added value of cooperation between cities, especially cities from the south and cities from the north? Thank you. So. I think, yeah, Mauricio, do you want to start there? Yeah, I, I think it's fundamental. I think it's fundamental. And I am a great believer in the power and the potential of city diplomacy. And one of the reasons for that is precisely the possibility it has for knowledge sharing, for benchmarking. Um, unlike the diplomacy uh, among nations, city diplomacy is not ideological. Politics doesn't matter much, which is great, right? Because you have a greater cooperation spirit between mayors than the one that you have between presidents, right? Um, <laughs> that's true, right? That's why I, I am so much in love with city diplomacy. And, and, and I learn a lot from it, really. Um, you know, whenever I, I talk to a mayor, I never ask. I have never asked Yvonne whether she's from the right or from the left. It doesn't matter. But I love learning about what she's doing because I would like to replicate those projects in my city. And I did it a lot, right? So I think that's, that's the great potential city diplomacy has. And, uh, and there are great examples of that with the work that uh, many networks of cities are doing, for example, regarding climate change. We have great examples. We have C40. We have the Global Covenant of Mayors. We have uh, uh, ECLE, the Mayors Migration Council. We have uh, UCLG, etc., etc. And, and definitely one of the main components of the work these networks are doing is precisely regarding benchmarking and knowledge sharing. So I, I think that that should be um, enhanced much, much more. I just want to agree with um, Mauricio um, on the networks. The networks are really um, a powerful um, platform that many mayors, um, you know, sort of utilize. And there's a lot of benchmarking that happens, a lot of collaboration. Um, Mauricio and myself are a member of a couple of groups, and and there is this constant exchange. But then um, there's also a, a, an evolving and very exciting development in terms of city-to-city -city cooperation on financing. So um, through the Blue Peace Initiative, um, I'm um, part of a um, development of a potential twinning, a financial twinning with a city in the north where we're looking at doing a joint municipal bond with my city utilizing the credit rating of the city in the north um, and having a multilateral partner um, provide the guarantee to that. So like, like Mauricio says, cities are really focused on getting the job done because if there is a flood, you know, I get that call at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, if there are people on the streets blocking traffic because of street trading, we are, we're, we're there, we're walking the streets, we're seeing the problems, and therefore we, we're, we have to address the problems. So we utilize everything in our arsenal, including engagement with colleagues, um, to learn and to get best practice and be able to, you know, share that. Uh, and like he says, I've, we never ask about politics. Je suis Ibrahim Kone. Ibrahim Kone, president of the uh, Ivorian uh, uh, Association for Intelligent uh, Transport Development. And uh, with your permission, I'd like to go back uh, with uh, on the issue of financing. I uh, I think it's important to say that uh, the uh, public-private partnership can be a solution to the issue of financing by allowing the institution, multilateral uh, finance and multilateral uh, institution, to focus on 
everything that has to do with institutions. As the minister said, there is a need for regulation in the sector or organization of the sector with uh, several modes of transportation, like in uh, Abidjan, uh, public transport and other types of transportation, buses, minibuses. So you need to have regulation. And that also means that you need to have a support in terms of financing. On the other side, I'd like to go back to my question. I'd like to, and th that's my question. Yeah, the question is, can, can what, and uh, that's for a Jackie Club, what can be the uh, possibilities of implementing mass solution uh, for service integration platform for all of the different actors that would allow to also collect uh, uh, data that would be available for the population in our African cities? Thank you. <laughs> um, Great question. So I think that already in African cities, we see ride hailing including ride hailing of minibuses, ride hailing of motorcycles. Um, so, and that's all done mostly by cell phone. So already there's this data that's, that's emerging through these, you know, the private sector initiatives. Um, I think the question of mobility as a service is um, difficult even still in, uh, in northern, in you know, cities that have better developed data infrastructures, I know that you know it's a question in in Paris and London. How do you start to really create a utility model of mobility? So people are tapping into different kinds of modes and pay, you know, through one system. And who regulates that? And and how do you manage the data? But I think there's a huge potential in African cities to improve the data infrastructure so that African citizens have the same ability to access different mobility modes, to get high quality information on their public transit systems. And that's what we've been trying to do with um, digital transport for Africa, digital matatus. The matatu data is on to Google Maps, for example, because of efforts of building this infrastructure. And I think this is something that has been somewhat neglected because we all need to move in that direction in some way. And there's a lot of creativity and innovation in African cities. And we cannot ignore that, and we need to build on it. So, um, you know, I think, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I'm very happy for that question because we need to think in, in those terms. Merci. Mm. Any quick additions to that? I think Carlos is just a quick. I'll, I'll quickly add uh, to Monsieur Conet saying that uh, it's, it's definitely not not just a huge, uh, crucial challenge, mobility as a service, and opportunity in African cities. But I'd like to complement by saying something that Yvonne mentioned earlier, and it is particularly considering uh, the increasing role of um, informality in in, in mm. cities and in transport. Uh, we have some incredible forecasts about what will happen in informal growth in cities in the global south. So uh, the role of mobility as a service, particularly for those uh, growing uh, informal neighborhoods, will be a great opportunity. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. We are at um, the end of our Q&A time. So, um, so let me first of all thank all of our panelists for your contributions. It's been a lively debate, so thank you. And um, I'd now like to invite Laura Tuck, who um, you'll know as the Vice President for Sustainable Development here at the World Bank, to make our closing remarks. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Sasan. Thank you, Fiona. And what a great panel. Let me. Um, Great perspectives, all kinds of insights. That was really terrific. I was I was really honored to be asked to close this um, this launch of the Global Roadmap of Action because this is um, I'm doing sustainable development now. I used to be responsible for transport, but this is an agenda that is so near and dear to my heart that I wanted to come listen to all the things that you guys had to say. I think everyone 
who's come believes in the importance of the sustainable mobility agenda in all of its four slash environment sort of divided into two pieces um, perspectives. But on at least one of those, and we didn't talk a lot about this, I think this agenda is more important than ever. I just want to take you back to the end of 2018 when the IPCC put out its updated report. And we got three important messages that the impacts of climate at 1.5 degrees are going to be much worse than we thought, that the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 is huge, and that we only have a decade to make a difference, to stay below 1.5. And to me, this, this is imperative for every single sector, and transport, mobility, has to be part and parcel. We have to make fundamental, foundational changes in every single sector in the next 10 years. And so every single person who works then on mobility in their country needs to think, and we explored all these different dimensions, but how to transform their system so it becomes truly, truly sustainable and can be a system we can take into the 21st century. So for that, it's really nice to see this tool. This is the first time I got to see the Global Roadmap tool. And, and for each country or city then to be able to think about how do I do it and what are all the actions. And in the past, we've looked at one mode of transport or we've looked at one set of policies. And so to be able to put them all together and think comprehensively with all these multiplicity of objectives that we've all agreed are so important and so foundational. Now we can think about how we can move it forward. And we have ideas and we can see, I don't know if the tool shows you countries or examples where those good policies have been implemented and what the success of it. It would be something that I think we would like to see because each of the different elements are, are so important. So I think now is the next step at the World Bank um, and our partners, and it's so nice to see our partners here too or online. It's, it's great how everybody's come together to work. Um, we need to op operationalize, such a great word. So what does that mean? We'll take these standardized performance assessments on mobility and we'll put them with the policy and investment plans. Um, and, and I think that we can then take that city by city, country by country going forward and make it a central part. I, I just want to say also as vice president for urban, since we have a couple um, articulate mayors here, that we do have a couple programs. We have a city competitiveness program that actually provides technical assistance for capacity building for project preparation and so forth, which you probably know. But we also have a brand new program we're putting in place called the GAP Fund that will help cities with their climate agenda, especially a big part on mitigation. So that to the extent you're reducing emissions and so forth from transport, there is funding for cities on that. But um, and those of you who are mayors, thinking about all the sectors, how, how to go forward in an in a era of changing climate. So let me give big thanks to everybody. I can see all the work. When, I was, when we first kicked this agenda off, when I had this under me, I could see the massive change and all the work. And it's fantastic that you have these volumes. So 55 organizations now. Nancy, a big shout out to you. But the whole team that worked on this is fantastic. Um, and the commitment that each of the partners has put, because we need commitment. As you said, these are tough decisions. These are tough choices. People respond um, in not always positive ways. We look at what's happening in, say, Chile today or whatever. I mean, these are important things. And so that commitment, we must drive it forward, believing in the power of sustainability. Um, there's probably nothing more important for the future, future of people's health, people's livelihoods, economic growth, jobs, future of the planet, than for us to do that. So with that, let me just conclude the launch. This is now launched. Congratulations, everybody. Um, and thank you all for coming.